So now I want to switch gears. Now that we've effectively talked about Virginia and the historical precedence of it. And I want to talk about another very important story that took place last week. It's an ongoing story. We certainly don't have a resolution to it right now. But the famous or infamous Texas abortion law, famous or infamous depending on what side of that debate you are on, and um, I would think most people listening to our program would be in favor of that Texas abortion law. I certainly am. That Texas abortion law and objections to it have been heard earlier this week in the Supreme Court. It's a pretty big deal. Almost anybody on any side would tell you that the ruling on this case, whenever it comes down, is going to go a long way in defining or determining the future or lack thereof for abortion in the United States. That's a pretty big deal. And of course, the justice system, particularly at the Supreme Court level, is not an instantaneous thing. Even though arguments have been heard, it's going to be some time before we, before we hear an actual ruling on it. And so, as is the case with most any Supreme Court case of note, or any Supreme Court ruling, well, it's time now for us to let the speculation begin, right? Everybody's going to chime in, everybody's going to say, well, I think it'll go this way, I think it'll go that way. And everybody's got their reasons for their predictions, of course. But the truth of the matter is, when it comes to the Supreme Court, nothing is truly predictable in, in, in any era. I, I know it's easy to say, oh, the Supreme Court has a... Uh, has a conservative advantage right now. It's a 6-3 conservative advantage, which is a little bit laughable because most people count John Roberts and the six conservatives, and good Lord, if John Roberts is a, is a conservative, then RuPaul is a straight man from Bodark, Missouri. So that's a little bit laughable. But even even if you can quantify that there is a solid conservative ideological bent on on the Supreme Court, which would be great if I was convinced of that. But the truth of the matter is we see cases all the time in which justices break from their ideological bent. And we see even more cases where justices will break from the actual text of the Constitution to begin with. Hey, that's how Roe versus Wade happened to begin with in 1973, don't you know? So one thing we can say about the Supreme Court is just when you think you know everything about it, you realize you don't know anything about it. That's where we are. So as cautiously optimistic as I'd like to be about this, as much as I'd like to say, hey, I I have reason to hope and believe that the Supreme Court will rule the proper way and the Texas abortion ban will be upheld, and within short order of that, we'll see many other concerned states implement similar uh, laws in their own states as much as I would love to say that to you and as much as I am hopeful for that, I can't tell you that with any certainty. The Supreme Court's a freaking wild card at any point of history and with any collection of justices. It just is. Maybe it wasn't supposed to be that way. Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but that's really what it is. So understanding that, the question comes up of considering the worst case scenario. What if, what if the Supreme Court ruling on the Texas abortion law does not go our way? What if they rule against the Texas abortion law? Again, I'm cautiously optimistic that they won't, but I'm not going to lay any money on that. So what if? Do you just accept it and say, well, we gave it our best, but the Supreme Court said that abortion's okay, so we just move on now. Is, Is that what you do? Obviously, that's what those on the left would hope we would do. That's what they'll tell you you should do. But does it really make sense to do that? 
Well, when we're talking about the murder of defenseless unborn children, I don't think that hypothetical situation makes any sense at all. In the event that the Supreme Court somehow rules against the Texas abortion law, I'm going to tell you what I think our reaction should be. I'm not predicting anything. I'm not saying Texas will or won't do something. I'm saying if this happens, this is what I think Texas and other states should do. This is what I believe the way forward is. I'm not saying people will or won't do it. But I'm laying out for you what I feel is the best course of action in that scenario. The very first thing I would say is that if the Supreme Court rules against the Texas abortion law, the very first piece of advice I would give to the state of Texas would be a very simple piece of advice. Which is that I believe in that case the state of Texas should simply ignore the Supreme Court ruling. That's right. I said if that happens, if if the Supreme Court rules against the abortion law, then Texas should just simply ignore the Supreme Court. Travis, you can't ignore the Supreme Court. By golly, when the Supreme Court makes a decision, it's final. It's binding. We all have to adhere to it. You're crazy, Travis. Am I? Am I really? Am I really that crazy? Is it really that unthinkable that the Supreme Court could make a ruling and that it could simply be ignored? Is that really that far off the page? History shows that it's not. Andrew Jackson once very famously said of a Supreme Court ruling on Indian removal, Jackson was famously quoted as saying, John Marshall, Supreme Court Chief Justice at the time, John Marshall made his ruling, now let him enforce it, end quote. In other words, Jackson called the Supreme Court's bluff. Because Jackson understood that, yes, the Supreme Court has gavels and and they have robes and they have a lot of mahogany in their chambers, but that's really all they have. You see, the Supreme Court's influence and the Supreme Court's enforcement measures, if you want to look at it that way, are really dependent, dependent only on our cooperation. The Supreme Court does not have guns and bombs and tanks. So when you really break it down to the most basic level, the Supreme Court can't force you to do jack squat. Their rulings only get enforced because we allow a system to exist in which their enforcement could occur. But they can't make you do it. And so Andrew Jackson ignored that ruling. And it didn't end up happening. What the Supreme Court uh, demanded in that case did not end up happening. John Marshall made his ruling. But it was never enforced. And that's not the only case. There's another rather famous situation. Fast forward to the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln... Honest Abe, or as I call him, authoritarian Abe. Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas of corpus. Not habeas, habeas of corpus. Habeas corpus is what I meant to say. I don't know why I threw an of in there. Maybe that just sounded more legal. I don't know. Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus at the time of the Civil War. Now, you may be asking, well, gee, how did Abraham Lincoln have the constitutional authority to suspend habeas corpus? And the simple answer to that is, he didn't have constitutional authority to suspend habeas corpus, but he did it anyway. And when authoritarian Abe or honest Abe suspended habeas corpus, the Supreme Court stepped into the ruling and said, uh, uh, Ah, you can't do that, Abraham Lincoln. You can't suspend habeas corpus. And what did Abraham Lincoln do? 
Much like Andrew Jackson, he ignored the Supreme Court and continued to inf- to suspend habeas corpus anyway, regardless of what the SCOTUS said. So what I'm saying to the state of Texas is if the Supreme Court rules against your abortion law, call their bluff. Don't enforce their, their ruling. Continue to jail people and convict them for having abortions. Continue to do it. Well, Travis, they might just send the, the National Guard or the military down there to enforce it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if they do, okay. You're going to send National Guard, military, whatever down there to enforce it? Well, and some people are going to get very uncomfortable with me saying this, but I should say if they want to do that, if they want to enforce their rulings at the point of a gun, then the people of Texas in that hypothetical scenario should meet them with equivalent firepower. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm saying if push truly comes to shove, that states should be willing to secede from the union over the issue of abortion and in a last resort, in a worst-case scenario, they should be willing to engage, if necessary, in war, in civil war, in order to prevent pro-abortion rulings from happening in their states. Now, I know what I've just said is a rather big statement. That when we talk about civil war in this country as a general concept, the discussion often starts and ends with the 1860s. But most of the time, most of us have never really sat and thought about what type of issue or what type of situation would justify secession from the Union. Maybe I've thought about it more than some because I talk about it on this show rather frequently. And I think even fewer people have genuinely considered or thought about what type of situation would be a legitimate justification for civil war. And again, I'm not saying let's go out and have civil war tomorrow. I'm saying that's an absolute last resort. I'm saying you want to avoid that if you can. But I'm also saying it can never be taken off the table. Because if the concept of civil war in general is taken off the table then, frankly, you and I have lost the last way that we have to keep the government in check, potentially, and at that point, we become subjects and not citizens. But if we are trying to consider the rather daunting question of what would justify a civil war, when would a civil war be legitimate? And again, most people probably never thought this question out, But if we are considering that, then don't you think it would make some sense that if there were something out there that would justify civil war, something that was so egregious, so horrible, that it justified that drastic of a step, if there were an issue that existed that justified such a thing, wouldn't that issue be abortion? If you were going to break from a country and potentially go to war with it for any reason, wouldn't the unrequited murder of innocent, defenseless, unborn children be a worthy reason to do so? I mean, we're not talking about money here. We're not talking about physical boundaries here. We're not talking about trade deals here. We're not talking about resources here. All, all, all of those things, of course, are reasons that countries have gone to war with other countries and with each other over over centuries. And some of those some of those reasons have been very justifiable at times and some other times they've not been. But we're not even talking about those things. We're talking about something so much more basic and straightforward and dare I say it obvious, which is the life of a defenseless, unborn child. Now again, I'm not saying it's going to get to the point of civil war in this country. I hope it doesn't. But 
if we had to go to civil war over abortion, I must tell you that I can hardly think of a more valiant, legitimate, justifiable, and worthwhile reason to do so. I know we've talked about secession a lot in this program over the last couple of years, and we'll continue to talk about it a lot more. I get the feeling. And as uncomfortable as it is, we've discussed civil war here and there, though we've always maintained it's an absolute last resort as we do tonight. But if the Supreme Court were to rule against the Texas abortion ban, and if Texas were to defy them and continue to enforce it anyway, and if somehow the federal government took on the risk and took on the bad judgment to then send guns down to Texas or wherever else to enforce that ruling, then I will not hesitate to say that Texas or whatever state it is would be completely justified in fighting back and God be with them and I would be on their side. No government, no institution, no infrastructure that exists in this world is so important that it supersedes the value of the life of an unborn baby. I know when we talk about abortion, most of us don't often talk about it in terms that are that straightforward. At least not in the general public. I know pro-life folks sometimes do amongst themselves. And I know on this program a lot of times we, we talk about many reasons, a multitude of reasons why secession may be the best path forward for our country or a split up of the country might be the best way forward there's a number of reasons for that but you never hear people talk about secession over abortion or even war over abortion but it strikes me that that might be the most legitimate reason of all to split up this republic potentially or even if worse comes to worse Engage in war. God knows at other points we have engaged in war for far less important reasons. And I hope it doesn't get to that point. But if it does, I hope the sensible parts of our country will remain resolute and fight as hard for the unborn babies as we fought for various other reasons. Thank you once again. This is Travis Cook, America's Evil Genius. God bless you all. We will see you next Sunday night.